Hello. Good morning. morning. Hope everyone slept well. Um, I'm a writer, publisher, um, and a number of other things, but the greatest of these is publishing. Um, it's, it's the best thing. And the last year, I've had a bit of an odd year. Um, I've sort of been involved in doing lots and lots of different things, bits of art, lots more technology. I haven't really been sure where it's going, so today I kind of wanted to go back and talk a way through, in fact, kind of go, go quite a long way back, um, and, and try and understand what I'm doing. Because uh, I don't always, but it sort of usually becomes clear in the doing. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about books. Oh, hello. Uh, books I have made. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, so, books I've made, 1986 to the present. Um, Wilson said uh, yesterday, and it's something I've heard before, that you, kind of the best job you can have in life is to do the thing that made you most excited when you were six years old. Uh, so, yeah, at six years old, I was making, my, uh, making books. This is the first one. Uh, it's called The Farm. It's a tale of suspense, mystery, a number of other things. Uh, uh, it's morning in the farm. Suddenly, suddenly the crow calls. I don't really know what to do about this, I'm sorry. Um, and it builds to a thrilling climax. Uh, and suddenly again, the people woke up. The end, Jamie wrote this book. Um, I'm proud of this. I'm very pleased my mum kept it. Um, uh, and it continues. It, it goes on. This is, this is from about the age of... 11 or so. This is the, the epic novel of Squeaks on Skis. Squeaks being a, a kind of crime-busting hamster. Um, what, what I really love about this is that I, I really understand publishing at this point, and I don't think I've learned any more since then. Uh, it's very important to have kind of like a publisher's mark up in the top corner. Um, the, the name is both by James Bridle and illustrated by the author. I think that, that's quite good. Um, uh, so like, I've, I've got all the... I, I've recognised what kind of the book looks like at this point. I, I've made something that's recognisable. That's good. Um, I only managed to write about that much of it. Uh, the actual writing wasn't necessarily the strong point. Um, it's about as long as the about the author section. Uh, and there is a full, a full content section, even though there's only actually three paragraphs of writing. Um, but it, it's kind of cargo cultish. It's kind of like building the thing that looks like the thing, and, and somehow you'll kind of, it will happen. Um, I, I think that's still what I do in, in most ways. Um, and, and so that, that continues. Um, I used to make lots of little zines and chat books. Uh, this kind of realization you can kind of print and photocopy, fold and staple these things. And you've got something that um, that kind of that resembles a book that has this kind of authority that you can kind of put the work out into and, and spread it. And that's a kind of lovely feeling. And so I ended up, by various ways and means, doing this professionally. Um, and so this was my first kind of proper job in publishing. When I was, a, I was an editor, I was selecting books, um, and I, I was publishing them. And it is the best feeling in the world. Um, for me, to take, to take a writer's work, to work with them, and put it into the world as this physical object that people can appreciate. Uh, there, is, there is no feeling like it. And the feeling when you actually get to hold this thing in your hands, or see the stacks of them, or see them even better in the bookshop, um, that's the most amazing thing. Something that all publishers and authors do is go into bookshops, find their books, and move them to the front. Every single author does this. Um, it doesn't matter how big they are. Um, but because they're yours, and you have this kind of incredibly strong sense of... of personal pride in them um, and, and, and desire to see them, them do well. And they're these you know, incredibly special objects. Um, and we got to publish a few of these kind of books. But what I've been doing in between the zines and this is also I'd been studying computer science. And I was kind of, I'd kind of given that up to do the books. But it became clear quite quickly that what publishing needed was people who understood digital and electronic stuff slightly better. Um, oh, yeah, but also I got to be an author while I was doing that. Uh, because, uh, because when you're a publisher, you suddenly realize you can just publish anything you like, so you might as well publish yourself. Um, you also realize that recipes aren't copyrighted, uh, which allows you to basically Google a cookbook. Um, so <laughs> I like to think that Google and I kind of co-wrote this particular book, uh, but it's full of good recipes. Um, and then I started publishing for myself. I started a small uh, publisher of uh, classic erotic fiction um, using print-on-demand kind of new technologies in order to be able to start a small publisher from scratch. And this started at a time when 
like these kind of new technologies were deeply distrusted by the publishing industry. It was thought that they kind of led to lower quality, it was bad publishing. Whereas for me, it meant that with nothing but a laptop, I could be as much of a publisher as any kind of major house. And so I could select these books and I could, I could put them out to people and I didn't have to have any cash up front uh, and I could be a kind of a proper publisher. Um, and, and there's lots of interesting stuff kind of around erotica and what's happening there. Um, there's been a massive resurgence it's recently, not particularly in these titles, but in anything. And the only thing you need to remember to understand that is that the Kindle has no cover. Um, uh, so carrying on these kind of explorations of this stuff, this is another book that we made. Um, and this is where it starts to look less book-like and trying to wonder out what's going on here. Um, if you can see that, so that's uh, Nick Cave's The Death of Bunny Monroe on an iPhone, which was the first book we made as part of a series called Enhanced Editions, myself and my then boss, Peter. Um, and the point of this book it was it was a full electronic text of the book, but also included with it came the full audio book read by Nick Cave um, and, uh, and a specially written soundtrack he'd made. And so what was brilliant is that we synced the text and the audio so that while you were reading this electronic book, at any point you could kind of tap on the text and he would start reading from that point. So you could switch between these two formats. And that's the first time those two had actually been kind of matched. We'd had audio books for a while, and we'd had e-books in a bit for a while, but trying to put them all together into one package. And we were kind of excited about that, because that was something that was genuinely new. Like, there's no point to e-books if they're just the Well, there is a point if they're just the same, but certainly not if they're rubbish. Um, and so genuinely looking at what the new technology could do that was different to previously was an exciting thing. I also don't think it's a very... I don't think it's a good thing, uh, in the sense of I don't think it's, it's better than what went before. It's interesting in this case, because you've got Nick Cave, so brilliant, everyone wants to hear him read. It's rubbish in the case of most other authors. And it's kind of saying to me, like, there are these new possibilities, but simply ramming together other bits of media um, isn't, doesn't, is, is not an additive process. It doesn't kind of make it better by default to kind of add these things to it. But um, experiments continued. Um, I was the first person, I'm sorry, to make a book of Twitter. Um, uh, I took two years of my tweets and I printed them out into a nice, nicely hardbound book, um, carefully typeset, all the values and uh, typesetting quality of a proper publisher, uh, and, I, and I did it to Twitter. Um, and, and I made it look like a proper classic and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I did it sort of as a joke, sort of as a personal backup, um, just to you know, not really knowing what I was doing. Um, but I realized what I was doing when I started showing it to people, because they had this really odd, complex reaction. Um, they, it, it, they found it deeply uncomfortable, many people, because, because you've taken something that they perceive as so kind of ephemeral and so um, transient and so lightweight and so unimportant, uh, Twitter and kind of the internet in general, um, and, and you stuck it within the form of a hard, uh, hardcover book. Um, this thing that carries so much cultural weight. Um, it was a really powerful kind of transformation, a merging of the two things. Um, but I kind of had to do it to, to see that effect. And that all this time, I'm trying to understand what's happening to books and e-books uh, and why they're different and why people react to them differently. And that was kind of one of the first clues that we have so much invested in our ideas of this object that things become very strange when you bring the digital and the physical together. Um, this is another little example. This is a, um, a set of 10 books. Um, I just made 10 of these for my friends a couple of years ago. We went to the South by Southwest Festival um, in, um, in Austin, in Texas. Uh, and what it is, it's kind of, you know, when you go to those big conferences, you get this massive bag of stuff that you don't need. Uh, but it's got all the schedules in it. It's got maps and all this kind of stuff. So I took all those and I put them in a single book. So you had a specialized guidebook just for that week. And again, I thought it would just be a nice thing to do, and it would be a, a nice kind of presence for my friends. But again, in the doing of it, you kind of discover what it is that these things mean. Um, so alongside the maps and all this kind of stuff, I'd, I'd put in, like, just simply the ability to write your name in front of a book. That turns out, I think, to be one of the absolutely most crucial parts of what we think is important about physical books over digital. You can't write your name in the front of an ebook, and that really bothers people uh, for understandable reasons. Um, but also, this is the other one, I got to see them using these books for, um, for, uh, for, uh, for about five days. 
So what, what I like about this book is it's, it's a book that's only useful for those kind of five days. And after that, it becomes a souvenir of itself. Right? It becomes a souvenir of going to this place and having these experiences. And again, that's what all books do. Um, you spend the time with them. Um, you, you feel them between your hands. You go on this journey with them and have this experience. And at the end, this book becomes the souvenir of that experience. Books, I think, are kind of unique uh, in media in that way. Um, there's, not, there's very few the albums, uh, to probably to some extent. Uh, and, and if you're more of a music lover than a book lover, then possibly um, more so. But for me, books, they, they stand as these kind of totems of their own experience. So again, that's kind of more stuff that doesn't necessarily work when we make things digital. Or if it's going to, we need to figure out how to recreate that same experience. Um, this, is a, this is another kind of project. Um, this was a, a, a bookmaking where I, t I wanted to investigate the fact that we've kind of been on the internet for a while now. Uh, we have history there. It's, it's, um, this stuff is building up, um, and that we should be have an awareness of this history. And I'm also fascinated by historiography. Uh, I'm fascinated by the ways in which we can tell the stories of our history differently. Um, and I, well, I'll tell you what this is first. Um, so what this is is a 12-volume uh, encyclopedia, um, except it's not many articles. It's the history of a single article. So every article on Wikipedia can be edited by anyone, and you can see the full changes, every change that's been made to that article. And it turns out if you take the article on the Iraq War and you print out every single change that's been made to it, that fills the same space as an old 12-volume encyclopedia. Okay, that's, that's one article, and it looks like this. So you've, you've got these, every single one of these is a bit of editing to that article. And it ends up this kind of volume. It's a, it's a visualization of the um, historiographical process. Like, this is, this is culture. This is how we shape the way we think about history and ourselves and our past. All right? But it's, we don't do that necessarily in books anymore. We do it through these digital processes. Wikipedia is this incredibly powerful. Um, it's not just a, a list of all this knowledge. It's like a framework for how we can put it together. Um, it's, it's, and it's a framework for how we kind of discuss that and reach consensus on it. For me, one of the, you know, the obviously bad things about culture is we, we strive towards getting this kind of one single version of the truth, uh, which is never right. Um, but at least here, we're starting to like make visible that process of making history. That for me is like a hugely exciting thing. And in this case, I'm just using the books to visualize what is a very hard process to see. Um, I, I think Wikipedia could be better designed to reveal that, but, and this is not a, it's not a helpful visualization, this. Like, you, it's, you can't really look stuff up in this, but sometimes it's enough, I think, just to point at the volume of the thing, just to go, like, this is a, a large thing that you should be aware of and you should be paying attention to. And again, putting into the form of the book kind of made, made some of those things clear. Um, I think, to me. Uh, it's a way of kind of making them a prop. Um, so, actually, yeah, so I, by this point, I think, and this is in the last few years, I've kind of sort of figured out what I'm doing here. So, professionally, I'm trying to make ebooks better. I'm trying to understand the processes people have with them. Um, but also, I'm, I'm doing all this kind of stuff of basically just printing out big chunks of the internet, right? That's kind of what's going on here. And I'm like, why are you doing this? Um, and, and, and I'm basically sort of pissing about on the boundary between the physical and the digital, and, and, and specifically moving a lot of digital stuff into physical. And I kind of realize at this point that what I'm doing is I'm doing that in order to understand what happens in the other direction, because most of the traffic is in the other direction. Most of the traffic is from di physical to digital. But by mucking about on these boundaries, you kind of start to see things. I'm not sure necessarily having that realization is always a good thing. Um, it brings with it a kind of self-awareness and self-consciousness that isn't always beneficial to work, I think. Um, but I, I'm tough. I'm kind of stuck with that. Um, so this is an examination of another aspect of books and what is happening to them. Um, if you, um, so we're now kind of we're digitizing all of culture right now. That's the kind of process that we're going through. Uh, we're taking all this stuff and we're putting it online. 
And one of the ways that that happens is uh, publishers box up all their books and they send them off to India, where someone types them up and sends them back again, uh, and sends back these digital files. It's kind of like the, the transmission of the classics in the 10th century, kind of all over again. There's this kind of huge cycle going on, but it's happening much faster and it's happening to everything. Um, so this is um, 50 copies of Dickens's Hard Times, which I made for an exhibition, where each text has been changed in some way. Um, so it's been, um, it's been run through translation fi uh, filters, or characters' names have been changed, or just little details, or even vastly larger ones. And it's, I'm trying to understand what happens when these works kind of get filtered through different cultures, because I've seen this happen. When books are pirated, they are changed. And the, the idea, and one of the problems with our current understanding of books is that we think these things don't change. We think they're fixed things, and they're not. They're always in a process of flux. They're always in a process of change. Whether that's um, the kind of actual like mistranslations of pirated books, or whether it's a more metaphorical flux of the understanding that we each individually have of the text. Those things change the nature of the books. Uh, and to think of these things as fixed single objects is not helpful. Um, this is the last book I want to show, uh, which is called Where the Fuck Was I? This was um, a year and a half ago. Uh, there was a little scandal around the iPhone. Um, uh, when it was revealed, it was storing lots of your personal locations, right? Um, and so I took all the data from that phone, uh, from my phone, which I'd had for about a year at that point, so I had about a year of that data. And um, uh, I printed it out as a series of atlases. Um, so every page of this book is a day of the locations that my phone had been saving. And it's interesting to me, I wanted to do it to see where the phone thought I'd been, right? Because A, I don't have the best memory day by day. This seemed like an interesting way of constructing a diary. But it was also a diary that had been constructed without my knowledge, which I found slightly weird. Um, that, that this was not a kind of intentional tracking. Um, and so to like build an atlas out of that was, is an interesting thing to do. But what was weirder is that I discovered something else kind of entirely, um, which is that it hadn't really... So it's, this is what the pages look like, but to make it clearer, these are just some bigger maps of it. And these are what each of these is days that this thing's recorded. Um, and you see these weird patterns. Like, I didn't walk around in these circles. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, but so what's going on here is not just... Um, not my position, but the, the, the device is kind of uh, mediating between me uh, and where it thinks it is, and a kind of invisible network of cell towers and Wi-Fi networks and, 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 and those kind of things to create this kind of strange, abstract machine geography, um, which, is, which is a different kind of geography to the one that I exist in. This is an atlas that's written by the machine, not by humans. Uh, and it's, it, it's somewhere between me and the machines. Um, and, and again, making the book of that was kind of what revealed about it. Um, well, it was how it kind of came to be revealed. So I'm, I'm running short of time. So I'm going to skip quite, I'm going to skip this project, but I would love to tell you all about it later. It's called A Ship Adrift, and it involves trying to get a small uh, artificial intelligence, which is floating in an imaginary airship around the world, um, to, tell, um, to tell a story about what it finds. Uh, so that, that little kind of robot that I identified in the, in the map book, I've kind of I've sent off around the world. It's following uh, wind and weather patterns, and it's trying to speak. Um, and I would love to speak about that later. But really what I'm, what I'm doing, what I've just done, is try to tell you the story of this progression of understanding through the books in order that I might understand it a bit better, because I'm not sure that I do. Um, as I said, I've had an odd year, and I'm not quite sure where it's going. So I wanted to run back through those projects and see if there's a kind of direction to them. Um, and the real direction that I've identified in them is, is, is that the thinking is done in the doing of them. Um, that's the kind of the thing that I have to keep doing to keep reminding myself. Um, most of those things, I don't really know at the time why I've done them. It only becomes clear afterwards. Uh, and the, um, so for me, that's my kind of, that's my takeaway from all of these things is that just as, uh, for me, the digital and the physical are kind of inseparable, are, are kind of so overlapping and intertwined these days that it becomes meaningless to try and think of them entirely separately. So doing and thinking and understanding are all part of the processes as well. Um, so what I'm going to do, and I hope what you will continue to do, is to carry on doing and thinking and understanding. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>